real estate in Milwaukee. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, today is Tuesday, October 12th, 2004. I'm Kathy Bernstein, and today we're visiting with Dory Chortek, or Doris. Which do you prefer? Well, my full name is Doris Barbara Hirsch Chortek, uh -huh. and everybody calls me Dory, so that's fine, as long as you spell it D-O-R-I and don't pull any Y's or I's or anything like that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Dory. Well, this is part of our um, celebration of 350 years of Jewish life in America, this uh, oral history project, and I thank you for joining us this afternoon and for already have you've uh, conducted two oral histories for the project before you even are sitting here, and I know you're you're, uh, you know just exactly what you're, you want to say, and but we're going to ask you a few things um, uh, that I want to know. And I, I'd like to start off by asking you about where you were born and your, your parents, where, where your people came from, and something about your life as a child in Milwaukee, a young child, a grade school child. Okay. Well, I was born at, at Columbia Hospital in Milwaukee, and um, my, my grandparents, my father's father, came from a little town called Kapulya, which is in Lithuania. It's now called Kapil, K-O-P-Y-L, and they say that there are more Jews in Milwaukee who say they came from Kapulya than ever could have lived in Kapulya mm -hmm. because it was a very small town. So it may have been a rural area where you just picked the nearest town when you said where you were from. So Grandpa Hirsch came here, oh, in about 1895 with um, his wife and two sons, one of whom was my father. My dad came when he was two years old. They settled in Sparta, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. He had two sisters, one, uh, and they came to Milwaukee and one ended up in Milwaukee and one in Madison. My mother's family um, came in about 1888 from Posani, P-O-S-A-N-Y, and I think that was also in Lithuania. They ended up in Marinette, Wisconsin, and uh, my grandmother's name was Wexler. Her father had been a rabbi. She came with two brothers who were rabbis and a bunch of sisters. So there were two very large families in Wisconsin, and so we were a large extended family as I was a kid. Now, growing up in Sparta, according to my father, was really very much fun. Grandpa Hirsch had a general store called the Fair Store, and I have a goblet that he evidently used to give away to his customers. Mm -hmm. um, said Sam Hirsch Prop, P-R-O-P period, proprietor, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they stayed there until about 1910, and they came to Milwaukee. They Why? left my. Hmm? Why did they come to Milwaukee? Well, I think Grandpa Hirsch was going to have a job uh, learning to build because he became a construction person. And uh, they left my father in Sparta to graduate from high school and finish running the store and close it down when it became time. Mm -hmm. So they all ended up in Milwaukee and there were a number of other children. Dad had one older brother, three younger sisters, and a younger brother. And they were all Milwaukeeans, mm -hmm. and they all had families, and so I had a lot of cousins, and, and a lot of second cousins, and third cousins, and we were a very busy family. My dad's great-grandmother was Rivka Fine, who married Svi Hirsch in Kapulya, and the Fine family also came to Milwaukee. So I had a whole bunch of extended relatives that were named Fine and Mosier and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It was very good growing up here. Um, we had a household that was um, fun and lively and quite Jewish, really. Mother kept a Jewish home because the grandparents were alive and they were Orthodox, so of course they had to, uh, they had to eat kosher food and so mother kept a kosher home. I think she might have anyway, but that was the excuse. She kept a kosher home really, oh, probably in t for another 35 years after I was born until I messed it up for her and there wasn't any need to have it anymore and that was that. In any case, we... Um, so they kept a kosher home, did they, did you They like belonged to Emmanuel and I went to Sunday school and um, we had Hebrew classes at Emmanuel B'nai Asher and then and twice a week I walked over from Hartford Avenue School and studied Hebrew, learned to read and learned some language. 
I have a question because it was my understanding, and I just I want to stop for a minute because I want to uh, let the uh, camera know that Jean Gilbert has joined us, and he's going to have some questions for Dory as well. Thanks for coming, I Jean. For being late. That's <laughs> no, no, no problem. This is this is easy. This is an okay. easy uh, go. I thought somewhere in my mind, I thought that. Hebrew was, was not taught at in Reformed congregations. Am well, it was in this one when I was a, a youngster because the parents wanted it. Then it went by the wayside and stopped. When? What, about when I don't that? know at what point they stopped teaching Hebrew. I know that they didn't do a bar mitzvah or anything like that because my brothers were taught at home and then we went up to Marinette where my mother's family lived for the bar mitzvahs. Mm -hmm. but it stayed that way and, uh, for quite a while, and then it stopped and started again when Rabbi Friedman came to Emmanuel. That's when Hebrew came back into the curriculum. And I can't remember what the day of that was, but it's before, hmm, before 1960. In any case, uh, that's how I learned Hebrew, and I still know some Hebrew. I don't talk it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I can read it and understand much of it. Um, I, have I had lots about, of. Hmm? I, I have a question. Sure. I have a question about um, you went to Emmanuel and went and went to Hebrew school. This is during grammar school or grade Gram school. Grade school. Uh, were there other Jewish kids going to Hartford Avenue School at the time? Oh yes, I lived in a neighborhood that wasn't predominantly Jewish. I lived on Frederick Avenue near Edgewood, mm -hmm. and. Um, Within the block, there were probably seven or eight Jewish families. So we were a good mix, and I had Jewish friends and non-Jewish friends. But Sunday school we went to, and I had lots of Jewish friends from Sunday school mm -hmm. all over the place, really. And uh, we stayed socially as a group. And, uh, and then we moved into Shorewood, so I went to Shorewood High School, where there were even more Jewish kids. There were. That's mm -hmm. interesting because I was talking to somebody, uh, Ken Burke. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure where you are age-wise, but almost he, the same. He said that there weren't. He, he didn't have. He was like he was one of the few Jewish families. Well, I, I don't understand it because most of my friends were from Shorewood, and we were all in confirmation class together. And Ken was in that class, That's and so it was not a small. Confirmation class. That's so interesting. Uh, isn't it? There were a lot from Shorewood, it, although it it was a very big school for its time, so mm -hmm. it may not have felt maybe not. And like he was it. in sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were very few Jewish kids right. in sports. He was. Um, so maybe that's where he. Got yeah, he was in the on the golf team. I know, and a year ahead, a year or two ahead of me, Lori Edelman was on the football team. There were there were some Jews mm -hmm. in sports, but not very many. But my close friends were Jewish, but I had a lot of non-Jewish close friends too, and that was good. Mm -hmm. the, um, the fun involvement in those years was really with friends, but as a really little girl, I remember, I remember performing in tableaus that Esther Cohn used to put up at, uh, for Hadassah programs, and we worked at the old Jewish um, the Jewish Community Center when it was on Milwaukee Street, and we'd do these rehearsals of tableaus dressed like nurses. And then, <laughs> la yeah. and then later on, when I was in Hebrew school, because there were you know, quite a few classes of kids, uh, we got to play the crowd scenes whenever the synagogue, the temple really, was doing plays for Hanukkah, and there were the Maccabees who were the older kids, but we were always the crowd scenes. And so that was fun to be on stage and do that. Um, love of theater happened very early. I remember taking elocution lessons from uh, Miss Friedman that lots of my friends studied with. And one of the best things I ever did for a Sunday school assembly was an imitation of Rabbi Hirschberg reciting Mary Had a Little Lamb. It absolutely took the house down, and I still remember what fun that was. Why? How did he speak? I didn't know. Oh, he was... I Rabbi Samuel Hirschberg was, um, well, he was what I thought Moses probably looked like. You know, he was very regal. And in those, in those years, Reform rabbis wore morning coats. So he was, you know, upright. And when he preached, his voice went up and down and up and down. And he came up on his tiptoes and came down again when he was making a point. So it was sort of fun to imitate him. Mm -hmm. Was he a good rabbi? Oh, sure. 
I thought he was. Mm -hmm. And Rabbi Barron was his assistant. Rabbi Barron was a close friend as I got older. And uh, and we stayed close to the temple. And you know, even even now, although I don't go as much, I was president of the congregation um, not so long ago, ten years ago, and uh, worked to put up the building that's on Brown Deer Road. And that's a whole nother experience of having to fight with River Hills to build a Jewish building <laughs> in the village where I live. And um, did and so I still feel very close to it. Did you, uh, was that like horrible, that whole experience? It must have been. Well, it was, uh, you mean building the building, getting permission? Yeah, all of that. It was noisy. It was confrontational. Sort of like what we went through with the campus? All that sort of thing, yeah. I don't think we had the over, what I thought was anti-Semitism that the center um, experienced. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. there were people who came to hearings. I remember a man saying he didn't want to come home from work, sit down on his patio to have his martini and have to listen to little girls laughing. <laughs> you know, he would have been 10 acres away and he was afraid of children laughing. So it was, uh, it was a difficult experience. But we got the school building built and I think it's a beautiful building and that's fine. Um, Jean, you got Oh, okay, you'll, you'll jump in? All right. Well, I was involved in a lot of other Jewish kinds of things as, uh, as an adult. Um, Where did you go to, did you go to uh, college? I went to Northwestern University and got my bachelor's in speech and worked in summer stock and, and worked in theater and worked at ABC television in Chicago. Um, enjoyed it very much. Came home, I worked I worked in a lot of uh, uh, amateur kinds of things where they needed a director for every organization in town. <laughs> okay. And I think I gave you most of the scripts. Yes, you did. Uh -huh. <laughs> so every Jewish women's organization did a play or a musical or a whatever. <laughs> and I wrong? probably directed it. And my friend Lois Shua and I wrote a lot of them. Uh, but there were some other very interesting kinds of theater experiences. For example, the Council of Jewish Women in 1951 started a children's trooping theater group. And we, we did a children's show, which Edie Mahler directed, and we would troop it three days a week in the inner city schools. And then on Saturday, we would troop it for money for the organization, like at North Shore Children's Theater and, or in the South Shore or someplace. And uh, we did that for many years. I directed them at the end of our run, but mostly I was in them and building the sets for them and doing that kind of thing, which was lots of fun. We made, you know, very close friendships. Um, there was a group I got involved with in the middle 60s called Children's Performing Arts. We, we met on Saturday afternoons at Faith Church, which is at 4th and Meineke, inner city, and we ran classes. Um, classes in dancing and um, oh, makeup and posture and all the various things that uh, help kids to grow up with a little more self-esteem. Fern Calker, who now runs Kothi, owns Kothi, mm -hmm. is Kothi, was, was there as a 14-year-old. And she was very talented even then. But um, it was an exciting kind of experience. Later, what, that? Like hmm? what, what, what years were, was that? Well, that, that would have been um, middle 60s. Mm -hmm. Then in 1968, I was sisterhood president in Emmanuel, and we decided it was time that um, some of the children of our congregants, our women, met some kids from the central city. There was no opportunity for that if you'd grow up on the east side. And so we began busing them in twice a week to Emmanuel and ran similar kinds of programs. We had music and instrument. We, we found people who would teach those things. And we brought the kids in. And the biggest part, of course, was eating. And it was an experience for the children. The women came and worked as volunteers, but they could only come if a child of theirs was in the program. So that provided us with volunteers and also the congregation kids mm -hmm. to be with the inner city kids. And, and they um, established some relationships which 
I have no idea if any of them extended, but probably not. It still was an opportunity, and we made use of it. How long did that uh, extend? Well, we did it one summer. I had persuaded the board that uh, we could do this safely. Remember, this, this was 1968, at the height of some of the problems we were having here, and everybody was a little spooked. So it was not an easy sell, but um, because the group of us who were doing it were the same ones who had done the Faith Church project, and we knew those people, and the, some of the parents were coming from that area as well, we were able to persuade the board at Emmanuel that it would be a very good thing to do. Well, that congregation had always been very forward-looking and very involved in all kinds of human rights issues. I remember walking for open housing with uh, Father Grappi and Dudley Weinberg, mm -hmm. Rabbi Weinberg. Mm -hmm. It just, it, those were things that we did. And, and do you, what do you think about uh, today? Um, do you think that that congregation or any congregation is doing enough um, outreach or? I, I never think they're ever doing enough. Mm -hmm. Do you think and they're doing, are they doing any? Uh, w there's some social action programs going on, sure. Mm -hmm. I only know about ours, and, and our rabbi is involved in that. It, I think it isn't as noticeable now because so many congregations, not only Jewish ones, but non-Jewish ones, are more sensitive and more involved. And um, it just doesn't get the big play it used to. But I think we have as many congregants who care and are willing to do social action programs. And, uh, you know, it was one of the things I cared about, and, and I was glad that I could mesh places together. That's one of the fun things about being involved. You get to make things happen. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed you do. <coughs> okay. I'll try. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, you graduated from Northwestern, and, and you, um, when did you meet your husband? Oh, not in co quite a he? bit. <laughs> and who is this person? Um, I met Sam 18 months before we were married, which was in uh, 1957. Mm -hmm. So I had already done quite a bit of my own thing. And um, he had established a practice, a CPA practice, here in 1946, but I didn't meet him. Is he a Milwaukeean? Madison. Okay. Sam was born and raised in Madison. Mm -hmm. And he was the eldest of seven children. His parents had been born in, his mother was born in Kovno, her family comes from Kovno, and his father had been born in Bialystok. Mm -hmm. They met in Chicago and married and then moved to Madison and raised a family of seven children. So um, that's, a very, that's a very close family. He's now left with um, two brothers. Four of the siblings are gone. And, um, and he's still, you know, head of the family. We did not have any children of our own, so we were very lucky because at a point when Sam's nep had two nephews, this is uh, 1969, mm -hmm. who were left without parents, both parents had died, and they chose to live with us. Oh. So they, uh, they have since grown up and married and had children, and their children are our grandchildren. How old were they when they came to live with you? 17 and 21. Wow. So we made our house bigger, and they one was in college and one was starting college. So, you know, it really was pretty good. Sam's mother lived to be almost 102, so she was around, very much part of the family. But, um, in fact, she only died in 1996. So she had her own apartment but was very close mm -hmm. to the boys and to us. And so we... Uh, that's about all one can say about the family. His aunts and uncles are pretty much gone, but he has a cousin in Michigan, and as a matter of fact, for the first time, we met that cousin's son who came to visit us last Saturday night with his wife. He'd come to Milwaukee uh, to a conference on uh, cities and suburbs, because that's what he teaches at Eastern Michigan University. So his family uh, is pretty well, the, his aunts and uncles were very scattered. So Sam didn't have the kind of extended family that I did. Mm -hmm. So we just sort of wrapped him in. And um, 
he probably knows as many of the Hirsches and the Franks and the Wexlers and the Fines and the everybody's that I do. How much, how many of your uh, cousins, uh, how much of your family still lives in Milwaukee and do you see them? I mean, like I, you <coughs> told me before about, you mentioned the Fine family and I remember that Geraldine, I, was her name Ger Geraldine Fine? Geraldine Montwood married Marvin Fine, is no. that what you mean? No, I'm thinking of um, Hack. We were talking about. Uh, that was Gertrude. Gertrude. Oh, she was G. a fine. It was a G. Gert Hack was a fine. Uh huh. Right. So that whole family is a so piece of my great grandmother's siblings' family. That Stan and and uh, yeah. Hack and all well, of those. Well, he's like a fourth cousin or something. Well, even, I have to tell you that when Sam and I were married, it was right in the middle of when we started the Fred Miller Theater. Oh, why don't you talk about that? Um, so that you was... you say when we, who's we? Well, <coughs> it happened because my friend Mary John and I, with whom I'd gone to Northwestern, had lived in New York after she got married, and she wanted to come back to Milwaukee, and she wasn't about to come back <coughs> unless she had a theater to come back to. So we decided we, we would start a theater. Her interest had always been in managing and directing, and my interest had always been in technical theater and acting. So we were a good combination, and we had been very close in college, and now it was some years later. This was uh, 1953. We'd been out of school since 46. And she came back. We found a few other people to begin to help us, namely, um, Jane Eline, who went first to her uncle, Joe, and his was the first contribution, gave us $1,000 to start with, Joe Eline. And then she went to Fred Miller, who ran the Miller Brewing Company mm -hmm. at that point. Eline and was, hmm? and which brewing company was Eline? Schlitz. Schlitz. But she went to Fred Miller to ask him to um, be head of a campaign to raise the money. And he said yes. He was marvelous. He put together, he got on the phone right away and started, <laughs> it's amazing to see. He would call up these guys like Tony Von Wenning, who was at uh, Freighted Malt, and Nori Ott, and it, all these wheeler dealer people, and say, I'm raising this money to start a community theater, and these girls are great. We were 30 years old. You know, kids could not do that today. Nobody would listen to them. He said, they're great, and I want you to give some money, and here's how much you ought to give. Well, it happened. We raised all of $120,000 pretty fast, and a lot, a lot of little, little gifts, $2, $5, $10. And um, we called on... Uh, my boss from Northwestern, Ted Fuchs, who was a theater architect, he came to Milwaukee. We had found the place, which was the old Oakland Theater, uh, Oakland near Locust, and he redesigned it all to uh, make it a theater in the ground, designed the lighting because that was his specialty, and when I had worked for him at Northwestern, that's what, that was my specialty. And we, uh, we, were, able, we were able to start a theater company and decided what it would be like. Well, it was the corporation was called Drama Incorporated, and we were going to we had a contest going in the city with the newspapers to find out what we should name the theater. Then, never forget it because it ties in so with a Jewish event. We were we were celebrating the tercentenary of Jews in, in Wisconsin. So this ha is this is like 1954. That's right, because now we're 350 years, and it's 50 years later. Yeah, uh, yeah okay. Yeah. Um, and um, Milt Hoffman had written a play. Milt, who belonged to Shalom at the time, and it used to write a lot of plays. We were doing the play at Bethel, and I was directing. And I remember the play. It was about Jews, um, pioneer-type Jews. There were Indians in it. I can't remember what the plot was or anything but we were doing the play at Bethel. And the night before the performance, Fred Miller was killed in a plane accident at Mitchell Field, and he and his son were, 
were killed. They died in the hospital, but basically they were killed. And so there was a meeting going on at Jane Eline's while the play was going on, and I had an open line from the stage to the play, I mean to the meeting, so that whenever we were between scenes, I could get on the phone and see what was happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's when they decided to name it the Fred Miller Theater. Mm -hmm. And we opened uh, that January of 55, did a short season, and then Mary and I ran the theater. We opened a school two years later, School of Professional Arts, and uh, taught adults over 18, out of high school, marvelous classes. I really enjoyed that a lot because I love teaching. And um, by 1958, we really, we got, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what happened. Um, a lot of other people wanted the theater. A lot of people who had formed friends groups and had been very helpful and all the same, but everybody thinks he can run a theater. Mm -hmm. And our secretary of the board of directors, who was an attorney, who had incorporated us, told us we were, oh, he had gotten involved in another theater thing and wanted to publicize it in our program that spring. Mm -hmm. And we thought that was not a good idea. And we had set the thing up so Mary and I could really do nothing really but appoint, we had control and could appoint the board and we could decide that, um, no, that wasn't a good idea. He said, well, you're incorporated illegally, and I'm going to let the Secretary of State know that. And he said, but, but you incorporated. He said, well, I incorporated you in a loophole. So he let the Secretary of State know that he felt we were illegal. And there was a lawsuit <laughs> that brought by the Secretary of State <clears throat> against Mary John and me. And this is all over in the newspapers right after I've gotten married. <laughs> You ask about Sam, people were calling him all the time and saying, <clears throat> I didn't know how to spell your last name, and now I really do. <laughs> but he was a good sport about it. In any case, that we, uh, we were pretty panicky about what to do because we didn't want the asset to be frittered away. And um, we went to one of the two people we could trust. We uh, trusted only two people at that point, my father and Rabbi Joseph Barron, who was my rabbi. And uh, we went to Rabbi Barron, told him what had happened, and said, can you think of anything we can do mm -hmm. so that this doesn't get destroyed and um, everybody doesn't grab a piece of it and run with it and that sort of thing? He said, well, why don't I talk to Joe Klatchy, who at that point was head of UWM, mm -hmm and see if the university can't use this. So he did, and Klotchy was very excited about it. And next thing you know, we're on our way to Madison to talk to President Fred, <coughs> who could hardly stand it, he was so excited. Here was somebody offering him a, a theater that was built, $100,000, because we had spent the money to rehab, but we had been so good with money and had done so well that we had $100,000 in the wow. bank. And <coughs> President Fred said, I can sell the Regents that idea. That's a great idea. The university would own it, would fund it. They, they would have seen to it that it didn't die. And it would have stayed a community theater and would have been great. Two days later, I read it in the paper that these two crazy women were trying to give away the community theater. And there were editorials, and it was terrible. They were <laughs> treating us as if we had thrown away a civic asset that really wasn't theirs, it was ours, but that's beside the point. In any case, we lost the, of course, President Fred and everybody backed off immediately. We lost the lawsuit, went into receivership, and a new kind of corporation was formed, which I then didn't have anything to do with mm -hmm. ever again, until the 50th anniversary of the rep, because that's what it became. Yes. The Miller grew into becoming the rep. I remember and, the Miller. Huh? I remember the theater and on, uh, was on so uh, fresh. Well, so that was a, that was sort of exciting. That is exciting. You were very busy with theater. Theater was certainly the love of your life. Did you work um, after you were married? I mean, for well, money I was teaching. Yeah, I was teaching at Downer College, but then. Uh, Downer moved up to Appleton to right. merge with Lawrence University. Well, I wasn't going to commute, and I sort of backed off the theater stuff. 
about then because I didn't want to work at night. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do any more much in the theater until uh, I did a job in 85 for MATC. <coughs> I helped one of their programs create a television series called Prime Time for Parents. So I worked a year on that. In the meantime, I just got busy at other kinds of things. I was on, became a, I got on the Milwaukee Foundation Board, and I was uh, chairman of the distribution committee and then chairman of the board. I had been on the planning council board, and we were recommending to the county about the distribution of mental health and social services money, you know, $90 million worth of services. I had been involved in United Way, involved in... Um, so, you know, I'd been involved in the Job Corps. I was the project director for Job Corps in the 60s. The, the Congress had forgotten to create some kind of a plan to train women who were young and in poverty. They did it for men, and they decided that the program for women was going to have to be all volunteer. So the National Councils of Jewish Women, Catholic Women, Negro Women, and, United, and Church Women United formed an alliance, and the, we were the seventh office they opened in February, I think, of 65. Um, the local groups got together, and I uh, walked out of a meeting, and I was the project director, and the, my deputy was Marty Flanagan from the Catholic Women, who really was one of my closest friends from then until she passed away just very recently. I was going to ask you, who were your girlfriends? Well, they were the sisterhood. Year. Uh -huh. They were sisterhood women. They were council women first, and sisterhood women. And um, I'm still friendly with uh, the people from Job Corps. It was Women in Community Service was our organization. I still have lunch every few months, used to with Margie and two other girls, so I, mm -hmm. I have the two other girls. I still have a friend I meet now and then I went to grade school with. Oh, my word. And, of course, Mary is in New York, but I still talk to her every month. And my college roommate almost married one of my brothers, but we stayed friends all these years. So, and she's I, in New York. Uh -huh. I just, I wondered who you're, you know, who you're. you're well, it's parents. mostly an Emmanuel group, mm -hmm. a small Catholic group, and and the people, the people I see, you know, I'm still in, very involved in community boards and things. Mm -hmm. Oh, you've been involved here on in different. Uh, ways here. I recall oh, yeah. you were in planning and allocations or something yeah. at Federation. I chaired allocations. I chaired the demographic study we did in 85. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. That was fun. Uh -huh. and, um, and women's division work, I don't know what you did in the women's division here. Um, well, I know we you've been did, around. We did uh, one program, an educational program that we moved from venue to venue. It was very interesting. I th the committee was convened by Esther Lee, and I can't remember um, what we called that program, but you know, they have evolved over the sure. years. So, sure. Besides always having cards. Right, of course, yes. <laughs> she says. Yes, <laughs> yes. And do you have, have yes. you done them yet? Talk a little bit about Esther Cohen, because um, she was a relative, I just learned today. And Esther Cohen, of course, the women's division has a very prestigious. Uh, award. Uh, I should have give, worn it, shouldn't I? <laughs> that we give very rarely, very rarely, and um, really rarely. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Esther Cohen. She well, was a, a force in this community when everybody was Mrs. Uh, I can't remember her name. Bernard. What, no, what was her husband's name? Sam, what was Esther Cohen's husband? Charles. Charles. Mrs. Charles T. Mrs. Chas. T. Yeah. Cohen is how it's yeah. always written. Well, Esther Lee and my father were first cousins because her mother was a Hirsch and a sister to my grandfather, mm -hmm. Sam Hirsch. Uh, so Judy and I are... Um, Judy Kaplan. Yeah, Judy Kaplan and I are second cousins. Um, I, liked Esther, I, I liked Esther, Auntie Esther, <laughs> very much. Um, I called her Auntie because you always called an older woman Auntie even if she was your father's cousin. And... Um, she was very hardworking, and she used to push us into shows. You have to talk to, <laughs> into all kinds of activities, really, and you have to talk to Judy about that. What I remember, though, is the commitment to Israel that that family had. Um, I remember the stories about, because I don't, I was too young to remember it exactly. Um, my grandfather was known not to be a Zionist. Mm -hmm. 
So Sam was not a Zionist, but his brother-in-law, Leopold Shapiro, who was Esther, Esther's father, uh -huh. was an avid Zionist. Right. And the family always spoke about how they argued and fought about Zionism. So that was the environment I grew up in. My father and his family really didn't get that involved in Israeli things, whereas Esther and her family were very involved. But they nevertheless stayed very close. And um, every time we did a thing with Esther, it was for Israel, almost always. You went to Israel. Yeah, on a tour, on a trip with one time. us. Yeah. I, you, said, you and Sam sat across the aisle from me. I remember you were doing uh, word uh, puzzles. Uh, Crossword? Yeah, all the way over. Uh, I, that could be. I remember. Yeah, I, I was, like puzzles. I was amazed. Well, I uh, <laughs> when was, that? I was, was a that bus in monitor. Or was that in 90? I don't remember. When was that? It was in 80 something. It 80 was right after, it was right when they were trying to break down the barrier. Remember, people were not going because of. Um, I think it was '89. It yeah. was our first. It was a mega, mega trip, wasn't it? It was a big. It was trip. huge. We had almost a whole plane we for did. ourselves. That was uh, Milwaukee. Yeah, 1989, and. Uh, we left from Sinai, yeah. from Temple Sinai, mm -hmm. on buses, mm -hmm. yeah. and went to El. I remember because uh, we were responsible for tennis balls. We had nets full of <laughs> tennis <laughs> balls right. that we had to take for the tennis uh -huh. center. Was Israel ever, uh, so you weren't raised where Israel was uh, center to your life? Correct, correct. But when I got there, you know, I, I think what I loved best about Israel, though, was the history bit. Mm -hmm. Modern Israel is not as exciting to me as ancient Israel mm -hmm. is. Although I have a niece living there, my brother Bob's daughter lives there, married to an Israeli, has three children in, in um, Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. One of my best friends, from school, from high school, Jerry Baum lives there. That's Dorothy Hinden's brother. Um, I, you know, I feel very connected, but not with the burning sensation you that a Zionist. real Zionist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, I wasn't exposed to that very mm -hmm. much. What else? Oh, I don't know. I think uh, we've <laughs> we've just about covered. Practically I just want to ask you about uh, a little bit about Emmanuel. I want to back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I wondered, were you, when you were the president there, were, were, was the synagogue already in trouble? You mean financial yeah. trouble? Yeah. Well, what happened there, Dory? Well, I, if, you, if you're talking financially, um, for many years before we ever moved, I think, Let's see, I went on the board at Emmanuel in 1968 mm -hmm. because I was sisterhood president. And then I stayed on the board for, I don't know, 15 years. I remember when Larry Katz was president and they brought in a budget that was not balanced and I said, and other people said, but we can't do this. We have to have a balanced budget. And somebody said, oh, we don't have to have a balanced budget. It was just stupid. And the, <laughs> the deficit grows over time. I mean, we're talking now, if that, if that happened in the 70s, we're talking 30 years later, you can have a substantial deficit and proper reins have not been drawn. Were never drawn. Mm -hmm. when, you were, when you were the president, did you try to, to make it better and nobody oh, would sure. listen or what happened? Oh, no, no. Uh, we, we were trying to make it better and sometimes we did. But you have to, you can't do it all at once because it meant massive cuts in staff. You have to remember there was a time when Emmanuel had four rabbis. Who, when? They had Oh Weinberg yeah, we had, and, and... Well, we had, there was a time when we had, I can't even remember all their names. There was Weinberg and Stanley Davids right, and, and somebody else. Terry. You know, sometimes the third and fourth, I never mm -hmm. knew. But we always had two. Mostly had three, and on a few occasions it, we and were a cantor, a, and a cantor, yeah, and an administrator, and, and a, a religious operation. school director. Uh, big operation. Yeah. So it's still a pretty big operation, although we only have one rabbi, one cantor, one religious school director, and one administrator. Yeah, that's four big staff people. And if you want to keep them, it's very expensive. Yes, it is. Um, when um, when Rabbi Weinberg died, 
was 19, what, 71? Um, and Barry Silberg had only been there a couple years. He was only 34 years old. Yeah. And so a group went to New York and persuaded the Union mm -hmm. of American Hebrew Congregations to let him stay because it would be just too traumatic to be deprived of your other rabbis so quickly. And they won that argument. Barry built that uh, congregation up to 1,600 families. How big was it under Rabbi Weinberg? About 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. Could have approached 14. I'm not sure because I don't remember exactly where right. all the different years were. So um, <clears throat> expenses grow and the need for staff grows. You have a lot of pastoring to do, yes. a lot of funerals, a lot of weddings, oh, a lot yeah, of bar mitzvahs. It's a lot of life cycle events. I think it just it got out of hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How is it today? Getting better. I think the board uh, is trying very hard to get hold of it financially. Certainly the congregation is stepping up. We lost a lot of members. Yes, you did. We always lost, we always lost a lot because we have an old congregation yeah. and it dies off. Um, but we're also getting new, young, very young families. The cantor is especially attractive is he? to the young families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had moved. No, that's why we moved. Mm -hmm. And uh, we lost some members simply because they didn't want to give to the building fund and they were afraid they'd be asked. So, you know, people quit for reasons like that. But um, I think it's coming back. I think it will come back. But, you know, I hear, you know, I hear lots of talk that Brynwood's in trouble and Emmanuel's in trouble and now Brynwood is... And Emmanuel's doing so. I, I always wonder what, what what's the reality. <laughs> what my, what Sam always says is, I got a country club. They say is in trouble. I belong to a synagogue. They say is in trouble. And wouldn't you know, I'd belong to both of them. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just have to wait and see. Uh -huh. I really uh, you feel good about it about its future. Yeah, I think we have such a good staff, and the members who are there are having such a great time. Mm -hmm. Good. That's good. Well, you know, we're in the middle of, we've been negotiating for a long time. We have your archives downstairs, Emmanuel's archives. Oh, boy. Not the photos, but until we sign a, a long-term agreement, which we haven't done yet because we've been going back and forth as to what the facts should be, um, but I've got an archivist here who moved to town who uh, came from the Cleveland uh, Case Western Reserve Jewish Archives. Mm. She's a PhD archivist, and she's just waiting to to uh, archive Get this for that. for us. So well, they're downstairs, all of Lillian Friedman's materials. The four years that I was president, I at least separated all my stuff into those four years. Mm -hmm. So there were four big boxes mm -hmm. with all of the history of the argument with River Hills, the court documents because we did go to court with them. Yes, you did. And um, and the judge's decision, which quoted me extensively, and I was very pleased about that. Evidently, I had said all the right things early on Good. so that they, um, they couldn't say we had. Do we have those materials? If in I the archives. Oh, yeah. If in I the got the archives, do I have those materials? Yeah, I because I got them out of my house. I didn't have room for any mm -hmm. more paper. Do you have anything you want to add, no. Jean? I think you're doing wonderful. <laughs> well, I'm not doing a thing. It's this lady here who really knows. Um, is there anything you'd like to, uh, how would you like to be remembered? Oh, funny you should ask. <laughs> and what do you think of the future of our Jewish Milwaukee Jewish community? I don't worry about it as much as some people do. Um, I guess because the young people I know are um, quite Jewishly committed. Mm -hmm. And it may be just a simple matter of who you know and how they talk. How would I like to be? I suppose the logical thing, I would have said two months ago, I'll be remembered as, you know, just somebody who uh, fairly talented and creative and, and used those talents for the benefit of the community, that kind of stuff, you know, those sorts of compliments. And then I went, we went 
to an anniversary party not long ago, a stand-up reception mm -hmm. at a friend's home out in the yard in the back. And, um, well, you know, we're standing around with everybody else, and somebody I knew but didn't know well uh, sat down, and she was having lots of trouble. She, she uh, spilled something, and she was trying to tear her napkin in half, give half to her husband, half to mop something up. She said, oh, what I really need is a clean napkin. I said, I'll go get you one. So I made my way over to the buffet table, and I got a napkin, and I handed it to her. And she said, oh, you know, you're really a good person. <laughs> I was so overwhelmed. Because Nobody ever said that to me before. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I so, think of you as a good person. Oh, well, we so that's how I just assume be remembered. Well, let's remember you that way. I can tell you, you are a good person. You've done a <laughs> lot for this community, the Jewish community, the general community. And well, the doing a lot, that's the, uh, you know, that's a different story. But you have, but that, but it takes a good person. All I did was give her a napkin. <laughs> no, no, she gave you a compliment. And she did. I know she meant did. meant so much to you. Yeah. Well, I want to wish you many years of good health because we just came out of all of our Jewish holidays, and I want to thank you for sharing your life with us today. And I know that there are many other things that we have to do and to, that we could have asked you, but uh, thank God you you knew what you wanted to talk about, and I and it was interesting because I learned well. Thank a lot. you very much. I enjoyed it. Good. Thank you too, Jean.